one of the people who believe that everything that's happened through history is an accident, and that while one or two things may have been planned, that most of history had no intelligent direction forming it, driving it. Well, listen to this, folks, and listen very carefully. Those desiring substantial evidence of the unfoldment of the great plan should follow the suggestion inscribed upon the monument to Christopher Wren in St. Paul's Cathedral and gaze about them. The rapid advancement in the social and political states of man, the increasing richness of human living, and the broadening vision toward individual and collective responsibility herald with auroral colors the rising of the sun of truth. There is much yet to be accomplished, but already the achievement is impressive. Even the most devout humanist cannot survey the orderly progress of the race and at the same time deny the existence of a well-integrated program. The light of the ancient Vedas is slowly but surely illuminating the whole world. The vision of man's noble destiny and the sacred sciences which made possible the realization of that vision have been guarded and served by the silent ones of the earth, the priesthoods of the sacerdotal colleges, the hierophants of the mystery schools, and the adept masters of the secret societies have been the guardians of man's noblest purpose, the perfection of his own kind. It is the inalienable right of every honorable person to be grateful for the opportunities which progress bestows. And with this appreciation comes also an appropriate measure of resolution. The past proves the future, which is but the extension of good works toward their fullness. The mystery schools neither restrained nor limited the unfoldment of human institutions. Man fashioned his civilization according to his natural instincts and convictions. And this process must continue, for growth is not hastened by the interference of authority. Man substantiates with his mind and heart that which he fashions with his hands. The esoteric tradition ensouls the ordinary works, revealing the larger purposes through the smaller ones. Not so long ago, 90% of the population of the earth was in physical slavery. Having liberated his body, the audacious creature must now free his heart and mind. Thus, pressed on by sovereign necessity, the world conqueror becomes the self-conqueror. Under a democratic concept of living, the responsibilities for progress pass to the keeping of the people. The powers vested in the governing body, functioning with the consent of the governed, include not only provisions for collective security, but also the advancement of such religions, philosophers, arts, and sciences as contribute to the essential growth of human character. An administrative system which ignores ethics, culture, and morality cannot survive as a dominant political organism. Democratic institutions must accept the task for which they were fashioned and become the conscious custodians of the democratic destiny. Progress demands the most from those with the largest spheres of influence. Vast organizations, industrial, political, social, and educational, have been made possible by the modern life way. These have become the molders of public opinion, feared or respected according to the measure of integrity revealed in their management. The future of human society is intimately associated with the destinies of these vast enterprises which have inherited, along with physical success, the duty, or more correctly, the privilege of world guardianship. Even the continuance of the economic theory now demands the strengthening of ethical convictions. Prominence of any kind, whether bestowed by wealth or authority, carries with it priestly obligations. The leader, whatever be his field, is looked upon for intelligent guidance. His convictions inspire his followers. His words influence their lives. 
and his policies dominate their activities. There is every indication that the esoteric tradition will next function through that complex of vast interrelated organisms of production and distribution which now dominates human imagination. While this structure may appear to the superficial minded as heartless and soulless, it is also the largest and most powerful potential instrument for the advancement of mankind ever yet devised. Education, science, and economics are today indivisible. They have already formed a partnership for their mutual advancement. Equipped with knowledge, skill, and the necessary physical resources, this huge combine awaits the destiny for which it was intended. There is no virtue in burdening the future with the conclusions of today. To prophesy is to restrict not the will of heaven, but the mind of man. Old principles, as they reveal more of themselves, will be given new names, and progress is always an adjustment of concepts, each of which is in a constant state of change. Assuming, however, that the term democracy, with its numerous imponderable overtones, conveys a conviction of natural unfoldment, it is reasonable to infer that the democratic motion will continue until all of its potentials have become potencies. Progress is not bound inevitably to any nation or people. Social and political structures are instruments for the advancement of the great work only to the degree that they keep the faith. If ambition or selfishness breaks the bond, the privilege of guardianship is forfeited. And this does not mean that the project fails. Rather, that which fails the project loses the privilege of leadership. The plan, then, passes to the keeping of other groups and other ages. Man cannot destroy or pervert the works of destiny. He can only divide himself from those works and by so doing cease to share in the essential vitality of progress. Thus it is that unreasonable doubts and fears concerning providence are philosophically unsound. Failure is always regrettable, but principles do not fail, and that which is foreordained perfects itself. Although empires may collapse, great teachers be martyred, schools and systems perish, and enlightened leaders remain unhonored, the substance of the great work remains unchanged and unchangeable. New vehicles appear even as the older ones are betrayed by human selfishness. The eternal commonwealth is an assignment of destiny and spiritual progress symbolized by the fabled phoenix rises victoriously from the ashes of the human ruin. The adept tradition has always available social instruments waiting to be ensouled with the larger vision. All things created by men are mortal and destructible, but the way destined by heaven is immortal and indestructible. Universal enlightenment and universal fraternity are the natural ends which reward the social struggle. The world and all that inhabits it are moving triumphantly toward peace and security. At any given time the vision may be obscured, but in the larger dimensions of time all things work together for the fulfillment of the greater good. Is that a piece of excellent retrospective writing looking back on history? No, ladies and gentlemen, it is not, for this was written by Manley P. Hall in Los Angeles, California, in April of 1951. What he predicted is what is happening, a wedding, a marriage between the corporate world and the state, which is coming. He's talking here about socialism. Under a democratic concept of living, the responsibilities for progress pass to the keeping of the people. The powers vested in the governing body functioning with the consent of the governed include not only provisions for collective security, but also the advancement of such religions, philosophies, arts, and science as contribute to the essential growth of human character. Humanism. 
the concept that man will become God. And the new religion will change with the needs of man, not man conforming to the laws of God. Democratic institutions must accept the task for which they were fashioned and become the conscious custodians of the democratic destiny, and so on and so forth. Manly P. Hall was an adept, a highly degreed fact. He was a 33rd degree Freemason and may have held many, many other degrees in the secret societies of mystery Babylon. He was a priest of the order. Now get comfortable. Make sure that you have everything that you need, folks, because I'm going to take you with me on a journey back to the beginning of all that is and we are going to come forward from that point to the present so that you will finally have an understanding of America's assignment with destiny. Three great cultural heroes were associated with the origin of Mayan civilization. Votan, who founded the Votanic Empire, seated at Palenque, Itzamna, the Yucatecan hero, and Kukulkan, whose worship extended throughout the Central American area. All three came from a remote region lying eastward, introducing arts and sciences and founded religious cults, or mysteries. From the legendary histories of these persons, they should be included as adepts or initiates of ancient secret schools, possibly Atlantean. In a book written in the Kichian language and attributed to Votan, the Great One declared him self a snake, a descendant of Emos in the line of Khan. He came to America by the command of God from a distant place. He ultimately founded Palenque and built a temple with many subterranean chambers which was called the House of Darkness. Here he deposited the records of his nation in the keeping of certain aged men called guardians. There is a legend, folks, that this Votan was the grandson of Noah. The original book containing this report was in the possession of Nunex de la Vega, Bishop of Chiapas, but he destroyed it with the other native manuscripts which he was able to accumulate. Fortunately, however, it had been copied by Aguilar. Itzamna, according to Cagulodo, was a priest who came with the migrations from the east. He was the son of the supreme deity, Hunabku, or the Holy One. Itzamna is pictured as an ancient man with a very prominent and strangely shaped nose, either toothless or with one crooked fang. Likenesses of him have been found indicating his birth from a plant growing from the earth. He is also shown rising from the mouth of a serpent or a turtle to symbolize that he came from the sea. He healed the sick and restored the dead to life. He lived, according to the records, to a great age and was said to have been buried at Izamal, or Itzamal, where his tombs became places of pilgrimages. Itzamna was sometimes called the skillful hand, and after his death his body was divided. His skillful hand was placed in one temple, his heart in another, and the rest of his remains in a third. One of the best known of his emblems was a tau or tea cross. It is now generally admitted that the Quetzalcoatl of the Nahautlan people the Gukumats of the Quiches and the Kulkulkan of the more southern Mayas were one person. In each language, the word signifies feathered, plumed, or winged serpent. This title may have resulted from Quetzalcoatl casting his lot among or gathering his first followers from the descendants of Votan. This tribal group had the serpent as its heraldic device. At a remote time, this semi-mystical, semi-divine priest initiate, Quetzalcoatl, came from the fabled land of the seven colors and established his right at Tula and Cholula. Quetzalcoatl 
was the initiate philosopher and teacher of the Nahautlan tribes of central Mexico. Among the appellations of this priest prophet king are quote, he who was born of the virgin unquote, quote, lord of the winds unquote, and quote, the divine incarnation unquote. Quetzalcoatl was the son of the universal creator god and the virgin Xochiquetzal and his conception was made known by an ambassador from the god of the Milky Way Torquemada, in his Indian monarchies, described a band of people who came from the north dressed in long black robes. Arriving at Tula, these strangers were well received, but finding the region already thickly populated, they continued to Cholula. These wanderers were great artists and skilled in working metals. Quetzalcoatl was their leader. Mindieta, in his ecclesiastical history, described Quetzalcoatl as a white man with a strong formation of body, broad forehead, large eyes, and a flowing beard. He wore a mitre on his head and was dressed in a long white robe reaching to his feet and covered with a design of red crosses. In his hand, he held a sickle. His habits were ascetic. He never married and was most chaste and pure in his life, and it is said to have endured penance in a neighboring mountain, not for its effect upon himself, mind you, but as an example to others. He condemned sacrifices except of fruit or flowers, and was known as the God of Peace, for when he addressed on the subject of war, he is reported to have stopped his ears with his fingers. Fray Bernardino de Sahagen described Quetzalcoatl as very homely with a long head and a very long beard. There was a recumbent statue of him in the temple at Tula, which was always covered with blankets. His vassals, writes the good Fray, were all workmen in the mechanic arts and skillful in cutting the green stones called chalchivits, also in the art of smelting silver and making other objects. All these arts had their origin and commencement with Quetzalcoatl, who had houses made with these precious green stones called chalchavits, and others made of silver, still others made of red and white shells, others all made of boards, and again others of turquoises, and some all made of rich plumes. Quetzalcoatl also owned all the wealth of the world in gold, silver, and the green stones called chalchavits and other precious things, and had a great abundance of cocoa trees of different colors, which are called Xochicacatlau. The said vassals of Quetzalcoatl were also very wealthy, and did not lack anything at all. They never suffered famine or lack of corn. In fact, they never ate even the small ears of corn, but rather heated their baths with them, using them instead of firewood. They also say that the said Quetzalcoatl did penance by pricking his limbs and drawing blood, with which he stained the magway points that he bathed at midnight in a spring called Zikapea. The interpreter of the Codex Teleriano Remensis said that Quetzalcoatl was created by the breath of Tonacatecotli. Quetzalcoatl was born on the day of seven canes and disappeared or died on the day of one cane. He was identified with the planet Venus. The Codex Vaticanus A says that the hero founded four temples, the first for the princes, the second for the people, the third, the house of fear, are serpents, and the fourth, the temple of shame. The Codex Chimopapka says that Quetzalcoatl was born as a nine-year-old child. When he resolved to leave Mexico, he reached the seashore, and, removing his clothing and his snake mask of turquoise, destroyed himself by fire. His ashes changed into birds, and his heart became the morning star. He remained four days in the underworld, and four days as a corpse. After that, he ascended to heaven as a god. It is specifically mentioned by Sakhagin that Quetzalcoatl created and built houses under the earth. 
Now, traces of subterranean grottos and rooms have been discovered in the vicinity of most of the architectural monuments of the Nahuas. There is a vast complex of such apartments near the Pyramid of the Sun at San Juan, Teota, Hawakan. The Amerindians believed the serpent to be an earth dweller, and it is quite possible that the accounts implied these subterranean and secret places to be chambers of initiation into the mysteries of the cult. According to de Borburg, the Mexican demigod Botan made a journey through a subterranean passage which, running underground, terminated at the root of heaven. This passage was a snake hole, and Botan was admitted because he was himself a son of the snake. Quetzalcoatl appeared as the great sorcerer, magician, or necromancer. He performed miracles, and upon his departure his secrets were entrusted to an order of priests governed by a hierophant or master. This priesthood practiced the arts and sciences, treated the sick, administered sacraments, and were diviners and prophets. Landa gives some consideration to the activities of these religious orders. Lucien Biart summarizes the available data thusly. The most contradictory ideas have been current in regard to this divinity, who now considered of celestial origin and now regarded as a man who had acquired the immortality of the gods, seems in reality to be a union of several personages. He certainly belonged to a race other than the one he civilized, of that there can be no doubt. But what was his country? He died announcing that he would return at the head of white-faced men, and we have seen that the Indians believed his prophecy fulfilled when the Spaniards landed on their shores. And of course, we have seen the consequences of that action. According to Sahagan, the most usual ornaments of the images of Quetzalcoatl were a miter spotted like the skin of a tiger, a short embroidered tunic, turquoise earrings, and a golden collar supporting fine shells. The legs of these images were encased in gaiters of tiger skins, and on their feet were black sandals. A shield hung from the left arm, and in the right hand was a scepter ornamented with precious stones, an emblem which terminated in a crook, like a bishop's crosier. Quetzalcoatl is credited with the invention of the pictorial or hieroglyphical method of writing and especially is his name associated with the Tonalamatl, our Book of Fate. This was more than a civil calendar, and was reserved for the calculation of human destiny and prophecies concerning the future of the state. It was used by master magicians, the chief of whom was an astrological adept credited with extraordinary occult powers. While it is likely that Quetzalcoatl brought the Tonalamatl back to Mexico after his journey among the Mayas, a people already advanced in such matters, the Aztecan legend has been summarized by Mendieta. The gods had created a man, Aksomoko, and a woman, Sipak Tonatl, as the progenitors of the human race. They, according to the legend, dwelt in a cave at Cuernavaca, and in order to regulate their lives, these two resolved to devise a calendar. Sipak Donato felt that her descendant, Quetzalcoatl, should be invited to participate in the project, because she was the mother of all the living and a great prophetess. Sipak Donato was privileged to select and write the first sign or day symbol of the calendar. The others followed until the thirteen signs were completed. Sahagan, in his general history, gave a number of details of the struggle between Quetzalcoatl, the civilizer, and Tezcatlipoca, who apparently signified the primitive and sanguine religious cult of Mexico. The old priesthood, which practiced human sacrifice and adhered to a policy of war and destruction, resented the peaceful and gentle faith brought by Quetzalcoatl. In the end, Tezcatlipoca, the personification of the sorcerers contrived to poison the god-king, which implies that his doctrines were corrupted by false teachings and interpretations. The poison worked slowly and insidiously until Quetzalcoatl, realizing that he could not combat successfully the old perverted priesthood, left Chula, 
ordering his palaces of gold and silver, turquoise and precious stones to be set afire, accompanied by a procession of musicians, youths and maidens bearing flowers, and flocks of singing birds, the old adept journeyed to Cholula, where the great pyramid was built in his honor. It was written that the Cholulans deeply admired the great priest because of the purity of his life, the kindliness of his manner, and his doctrines of peace and brotherhood. He remained with them for nearly twenty years, slowly sickening from the poison which was destroying his body. At last he realized that his ministry was coming to an end, so he continued his long journey toward the mysterious city of Tlapalan, from which he had come. He turned toward the east and proceeded to the sea, which he reached at a point a few miles south of Veracruz. Here he blessed the four young men who had accompanied him and bade them return to their homes, with his promise that one day in the future he would return and restore his kingdom among them. Tonight's program, ladies and gentlemen, comes from a book by Manley P. Hall named America's Assignment with Destiny. Then the old and weary man called to the sea, and out of the waters came a raft of serpents. He stepped upon this strange craft and was carried away into the land of the sun's beginning. He left behind him a priesthood that perpetuated with esoteric rites the mysteries of the feathered serpent. There is every indication, folks, that the cult of Quetzalcoatl was kept secret, a precaution necessary in the face of the opposition of the primitive indigenous sects. There are several accounts of the death or departure of Quetzalcoatl. The conflict is due in part to the legends being derived from different tribes and in part to the Spanish methods of gathering the reports. Now these invaders took slight interest in the native traditions until they had destroyed most of the available sources of information. Later, even the converted Indians were uncertain of their tribal history. There's reason to believe, however, that some sacred records were intentionally suppressed and were never available to the missionaries. The people of Mexico claimed to have sacred accounts of the mysteries of their religion and the origin of their race. There's mention of the divine book written by Tezcucan, a wise man or wizard whose name means Lord of the Great Hand. This was supposed to contain the account of the migration of the Aztecs from Asia. Baron de Waldeck claimed that the book had once been in his possession. De Bourbourg thought it was the Dresden Codex. The Bustamante wrote that native historians had a copy in their possession at the time of the fall of Mexico. Now there is good probability that manuscripts of great value survived the Spanish colonial period and are still available to certain qualified persons. Augustus Le Plongeon, known to the Yucatecans as Great Blackbeard, was one of the few Americanists to be accepted into the confidence of the ever-reticent Indians. They told him enough to convince a thoughtful man of the existence of esoteric schools in the Mayan area. Quote, that sacred mysteries, unquote, writes Le Plongeon, have existed in America from times immemorial, there can be no doubt. Even setting aside the proofs, of their existence that we gather from the monuments of Uxmal and the descriptions of the trials of initiation related in the sacred book of the quiches, we find vestiges of them in various other countries of the western continent. The rites and ceremonies of initiation were imported in Peru by the ancestors of Manco Capac, the founder of the Inca dynasty, who were colonists from Central America as we learn from an unpublished manuscript written by a Jesuit father, Reverend Anello Oliva, at the beginning of the year 1631 in Lima, and now it resides in the library of the British Museum in London. A number of authors have tried to prove that Quetzalcoatl was a foreigner who, reaching the shores of the New World at an early time, attempted the civilization of the aboriginal tribes. Lord Kingsborough, favored the possibility that this wanderer was actually the Apostle Thomas, and that the ancient Central American Indians came under Christian or Jewish influence. Always deeply concerned with the possibilities of linking the worship in the Americas with the religions of the Near East, his lordship writes, 
The Messiah is shadowed in the Old Testament under many types, such as those of a lion, a lamb, a rose, the morning star, or the planet Venus, otherwise called Lucifer. The sun, light, a rock, a stone, the branch, the vine, wine, bread, water, life, the way. And he is there recognized in the triple character of a king, a priest, and a prophet. It is very extraordinary that Quetzalcoatl, whom the Mexicans believed equally to have been a king, a prophet, and a pontiff, should also have been named by them Sayacatl, or Keacatl, or the Morning Star. La Vizcalpantecutli, or light. Mexitli, or the vine. For Torquemada said that the core of the aloe from which the Mexicans obtained wine was so called. Votan, or the heart, metaphorically signifying light. And Toilietlquetl, Manyar de Nestra Veda, bread for his body made of dough, was eaten by the Mexicans. Las Casas, quoting Padre Francisco Hernandez, says that an old Yucatecan described the ancient religion of his people thus, that they recognized and believed in God who dwells in heaven, and that this God was Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and that the Father was called Icona, who had created men and all things, that the Son was called Bacab, and that he was born of a virgin called Chiberius, who is in heaven with God. The Holy Spirit they tamed Ichuit. The son Bacab was scourged and crowned with thorns, was tied upon a cross with extended arms where he died, but after three days he arose and ascended into heaven to be with his father. Dr. Alexander, who reports this story in his book, is inclined to feel that it is confused and probably distorted by the Spanish recorder. On the other hand, the universal distribution of the basic theme may be explained another way. Among the Lacandones, Quetzalcoatl is still represented as a snake with many heads. There is an account that this snake was killed and eaten at times of great national pearl, especially at eclipses, which were regarded as portents of disaster. It was believed by the Mayas that Kulkulkan descended invisibly from the sky and personally received the offerings during great feast held in his honor. For details of this, consult The Mythology of All Ages, Volume 11, Latin American by Hartley Burr Alexander. Now, Daniel Brenton, in his Essays of an Americanist, devoted some thought to the magical powers attributed to the priests of Central America. He mentioned Father Bieza and an English priest, Thomas Gage, who reported cases of sorcerers transforming themselves into animals and performing other miracles. De Borborg was not entirely convinced that ventriloquism, animal magnetism, or the tricks familiarly employed by conjurers explained the mysteries of Nagalism, as the black art of these Indians is called. Britain quotes from the Popol Vuh, Truly, thus, Gukumats, Quetzalcoatl, became a wonderful king, Every seven days he ascended to the sky, and every seven days he followed the path to the abode of the dead. Every seven days he put on the nature of a serpent, and he became truly a serpent. Every seven days he put on the nature of an eagle, and again of a tiger, and he became truly an eagle and a tiger. It is evident from available authorities that the Mayas and Aztecs had an extensive body of legendary and lore which originated in the mysteries of their religions and proves the existence of an elaborate system of secret rites and ceremonies. In the form of a feathered snake, Quetzalcoatl overshadowed a dynasty of rulers and priests, some of whom later assumed his name and even his mask symbol. These later Quetzalcoatls have been confused, like the several Zoroasters of Persia, into one person, with the resulting conflict in dates. Recent excavations would indicate that the cult of the feathered serpent was established before the beginning of the Christian era and did not arise in the 10th or 11th century A.D. as held by some modern archaeologists. In fact, it is more likely that the ancient hero was said to have been reborn or to have overshadowed a later leader of the nation. 
All the accounts imply that the religious order which served the mysteries of Quetzalcoatl was long established, and those who follow in the way which he had prescribed lived most severe lives. Children were consecrated to his temples from their birth and were marked by a special collar. At the end of the second year, the child was scarified in the breast. When it was seven years old, it entered a seminary where it took vows covering personal conduct and public duties, including prayers for the preservation of its family and its nation. There were many of these priestly brotherhoods, and the Spanish missionaries, in spite of their theological prejudices and intolerances, were forced to admit that the Aztecan priests were excellent scholars and lived austere and pure lives. It was said of these missionaries that in Quetzalcoatl, who taught charity, gentleness, and peace, they thought they saw a disciple of Jesus Christ. The kings of the Mexican nations, like those of ancient Egypt, were also initiates of the state mysteries. Turkmata described the attainments of Nazahalpili, the king of Texcuco. This learned man gathered about him masters of the science and arts and gained a wide reputation as an astrologer and seer. When Montezuma was elected to rule over the complex of Nahautlan nations, King Nazahautpili stood before the young man and congratulated the entire nation for having selected such a ruler, whose deep knowledge of heavenly things ensured to his subjects his comprehension of those of an earthly nature. The interpreter of the collection of Mendoza described Montezuma as, by nature wise, an astrologer and philosopher and skilled and generally versed in all the arts both in those of the military as well as those of a civil nature and from his extreme gravity and state the monarchy under his sway began to verge towards empire the great serpent clothed in quetzal plumes certainly belonged to another race and came from an unknown country lucian biart says it is an incontestable fact that Quetzalcoatl created a new religion based upon fasting, penitence, and virtue. In skillful trades and in metalworking, this Amerindian savior reminds one of the craftsmen of Tyre who cast the ornaments for Solomon's temple as a benefactor of his people, as a liberator of men's minds and hearts. This Nahautlan demigod certainly revealed the attributes of the master builder. Folks, are you beginning to hear the implications that this may be connected to the ancient mysteries and directly to Freemasonry? For that is exactly what Manly Hall is putting across. Scattered through the jungle of Yucatan and extending northward into Chiapas and southward into Honduras and Guatemala are the remains of ancient cities and the ruins of old cultural centers, religious or educational, dedicated to scientific research and the investigation of the spiritual mysteries of human life. These shrines and temples are adorned with numerous religious emblems and figures and closely resemble the temples and schools of the esoteric tradition which were scattered through the Mediterranean countries, North Africa, and the Near East. The Aztecs, inhabiting the Valley of Mexico, certainly derived much of their cultural impetus from the more highly civilized Mayas. These Nahuas practiced elaborate rites and ceremonies and recognized a large pantheon of divinities. It seemed unlikely that the Aztecs patterned their religious concepts from some inferior cultural tradition. There are positive indications that the tribes of central Mexico had received an important intellectual stimulus from the Mayas and even found it expedient to acknowledge this indebtedness. The physical remains of the Maya civilization are sufficiently impressive to indicate a highly advanced people whose religious institutions and rites had reached a considerable degree of refinement. Most early writers, in an attempt to estimate the cultural attainments of these nations, have been over-influenced by the early theologians and scientific enthusiasts who invaded the field with a variety of concepts and, of course, preconceptions. The empires of the Mayas and Aztecs were resplendent with edifices dedicated to their faiths. There were magnificent shrines, temples, and altars, some to sanguinary deities and others to benign and kindly gods. 
The state mysteries, however, were seldom performed in the sanctuaries of popular worship. Neophytes traveled to remote places, and if they went uninvited, they seldom, if ever, returned. Throughout the jungle are the ruins of extraordinary buildings constructed for unknown purposes, the mysteries of Zibalba, as recorded in the Popova, and traditionally associated with the culture hero Votan, were given in such an architectural complex which served as an entrance to a mysterious world beyond the dimensions of the material mind. Such gateways existed in all the old countries where the mystery religion originally flourished. Obviously, archaeologists cannot discover the secret rites merely by grubbing among the overturned and broken stones. As the priesthoods were not considerate enough to label their monuments, there is little left today even to excite curiosity. Fortunately, however, the esoteric tradition survives in the racial subconscious, whatever that is, and its violated schools and colleges need not be physically restored. When such restoration is attempted, the buildings usually reveal that they were designed as symbols of the cosmos. If the mystery system existed in the Western Hemisphere, as the landmarks indicate, it must have produced its initiates and adepts. These, in turn, became the leaders and saviors of their peoples. The wonder-working hero whose deeds enriched all tribal traditions, always and everywhere performed the same miracles, possessed the same powers, and made the same personal sacrifices. The mystery school required not only a hierarchy for its maintenance and perpetuation, but also appropriate places of initiation, partly underground or adjacent to grottoes and caverns. It required also a body of lore, peculiarly significant, participation in which conferred special rights and privileges. A people which had reached the mental platform of the Mayas would not have accepted a philosophy of life that was without profound and significant values. Pagan priesthoods did not initiate those of feeble mind, but selected for spiritual advancement persons of high attainment and mature judgment. Albert Reveille in the Hybard Lectures, 1894, notes of the religion of the plumed serpent. There was something mysterious and occult about the priesthood of this deity, as though it were possessed of divine secrets or promises, the importance of which it would be dangerous to undervalue. It is fortunate, indeed, that at least one manuscript relating to the religious mysteries formerly practiced in the Mayan area has been recovered. The Popova, or the Senate Book of the Quiches, the record of the community has survived the numerous vicissitudes which have conspired to prevent the perpetuation of the literary monuments of Central America. It was tolerated by the early missionaries, who, observing certain similarities to their own scriptures, preserved the work as a means of persuading the Indians to a more speedy baptism. In the 17th century, it was rescued from a fate worse than oblivion by the Dominican monk Don Ramon de Ordones y Aguirre, dean and chancellor of the Archbishopric of Cuidad Real. The work was deposited in the library of the convent at Chichi Castanango by its scholiast Zeminis, where it remained until 1830. The manuscript of the Popova was rediscovered about 1855 by Dr. Cesar in the library of the University of San Carlos, Guatemala City. Through the industry and scholarship of that ardent antiquarian, the Abbey Brachur de Bourbourg, this mysterious book of the quiches came at last to the French language, where it lingered for years, awaiting English translation. Dr. Scherzer was responsible for a Spanish version published in Vienna in 1856. The first English translation has remained practically unknown to students of Central American archaeology, as it appeared serially in The Word, a magazine devoted to theosophical and related subjects. The translation was made by Kenneth S. Guthrie, M.A., Ph.D., M.D., and was based upon the French text. A new English translation 
from the Spanish of Adrian Ricinos has just been issued by the University of Oklahoma Press. And folks, that was in 1951. This version is by Delia Goetz and Sylvanus G. Morley and includes important introductory and commentary material. Writing under the pseudonym, Aretas James Price issued part of the Popol Vuh with learned commentaries under the title, The Book of the Azure Veil. Vale. This ran in Lucifer, a theosophical magazine, between September 1894 and February 1895. It concluded with a note that circumstances made it impossible for the translator to finish the work. Price suggests that the god Quetzalcoatl was known in Peru under the name of Amaru. He writes, From the latter name comes our word America. Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumed serpent. The priests of this god of peace, from their chief center in the Cordilleras, once ruled both Americas. All the red men who have remained true to the ancient religion are still under their sway. One of the strong centers was in Guatemala, and of their order was the author of the book called Popol Vuh. Although Dr. Scherzer published his copy under the title Las Historias del Origen de los Indios de Guatemala por el Arp P. F. Francisco Ziminis, this is misleading. Ziminis was not the author, but acted in the capacity of scribe, translator, and commentator. The work is said to have been compiled originally in the 17th century by a Guatemalan who had been converted to Christianity. Most American Indians are unsatisfactory converts, for they accept new beliefs without discarding old convictions. This is a most fortunate state of affairs, as there is little indication that the indigenous mythology has been compromised. The source of the material compiled by this convert is completely unknown, but it could well have been derived from a secret book or from oral tradition guarded in the sanctuaries of the mysteries. Now, to have secured it, the compiler must himself have been a priest or initiate. Certainly, the Popol Vuh is by far the outstanding available text on pre-Columbian mythology and cosmology existing. The Kishian scribe, in his introduction to the Popol Vuh, writes, The following is what we shall write, and we place it in writing, because since the word of God has been promulgated, and hereafter during the cycle of Christianity, the book of the azure green veil is no longer to be seen in which it could be clearly perceived that it had come from the further shore of the sea, which book has been called The Record of Our Existence in the Overshadowing World, and How We There Beheld Light and Life. Now, note that this translation by Price is somewhat fuller than that given by Guthrie and seems to be more in the spirit of the quiche tradition. And the implication, folks, is that the work originated behind the azure veil. This can have two meanings, either the veil which divides the spiritual universe from the material world, or the veil in the temple of initiation, behind which are the seven lords of the great heart. The Popol Vuh consists of a mythology gradually mingling in its descent with the beginnings of history. The early part deals almost entirely with superhuman beings and the latter part with the heroic deeds of authentic personages. It opens with a description of the creation. All was calm and silent, and the face of the earth was not yet to be seen. In the eternal darkness and quietude was the Creator, the Lord and Maker, and Gukumats, the plumed serpent, they were surrounded with green and azure, and they were those who engendered. Then the word came and spake with them, and they joined their counsels. Those who engender then said, Let it be done. Let the waters retire and cease to obstruct, to the end that it be sown, and that the light of day shine in the heavens and upon the earth. For we shall receive neither glory nor honor from all that we have created and formed, until human beings exist endowed with sentience. Thus the Creator said, Earth, and immediately it was formed. 
The book proceeds much in the spirit of the scriptures of other nations. It is divided generally into four parts. Cosmogony, Theogony, Anthropology, and Regeneration through Initiation. It is presented in semi-historical form and includes the initiation of its heroes into the mysteries of Xibalba. The heroes of the Popova were subjected to several ordeals of tests of courage, fortitude, and skill. The seventh test took place in the House of the Bat. This was a subterranean labyrinth inhabited by weird monsters and ruled over by Gamatzots, a fearful creature with the body of a man and the wings and the head of a bat. Naturally, the account is clothed in the culture symbolism of the Mayas, but it is certainly to be compared with such productions as the Finnish Kalevala and the Icelandic Edas. Guthrie presents a number of important parallelisms to the mysteries of the Egyptians, Chaldeans, and Greeks. According to him, the twelve trials are tests through which the neophytes pass are analogous with the signs of the zodiac. He goes so far as to hazard the speculation that the twelve princes of Zibalba were the rulers of the Atlantean Empire, and their final destruction referred to the tragic end of Atlantis. The Popol Vuh follows the traditional form by involving its principal characters in a series of superhuman and supernatural adventurers. The work is certainly an account of the perilous journey which is the usual means employed to veil thinly the story of initiation. By comparison with the oral traditions of the northern Amerindian tribes, the legend unfolds what Dr. Paul Radden beautifully calls the Road of Light. Medicine priests have freely acknowledged that in dreams and trances they could leave their bodies and travel to the abodes of the gods and the dead. To make this journey while still living is initiation, for it is conscious participation in the fact of immortality. In some cults, the neophyte was given sacred drugs to intensify his psychic faculties, as in the case of the notorious peyote sect, or was subjected to hypnotic influence like the followers of the ghost shirt religion. By some means, a condition of death was simulated and the consciousness or superior self passed through certain internal experiences of which at least a partial memory was preserved. The entire process of creation took place within the green and azure coils of the plumed serpent. On several continents, the serpent was among the important symbols of the initiate priest. Sometimes the serpent stands erect and is crowned, as in Egypt, or it may be winged, as among the Mongolians, or feathered and plumed, as throughout the Americas. Obviously, the natives did not intend to imply that they believed in the actual existence of winged snakes, for no such creatures ever existed among them. The serpent was a wisdom symbol, and when plumed, it meant that wisdom had been given wings and had become spirit, wisdom, or illumination. Price suggests that Matthew chapter 10 verse 16 explains the symbolism of the snake bird. Quote, Behold, I send you as sheep into the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and guileless as doves. Unquote. Now let me read the same passage from Matthew chapter 10 verse 16 again with the mystery religion meaning. Quote, Behold, I send you as neophytes into the midst of the profane. Be ye therefore wise as magicians and guileless as mystics." Unquote. Mr. Price was a Greek scholar and his translation differed slightly from the King James Version as you can see. He felt that the Quetzal had the same meaning as dove and that the creature combining the serpent wisdom and the bird intuition or inspiration represented the adept in whom the mind and heart doctrine were completely reconciled. The conflict between the initiate and the adversary are the paths of white and black magic is always present. In the story of Deganoida, the power of evil was personified by Atotarho, an old war chieftain who had a cluster of venomous serpents on his head in place of hair. The Mexican Quetzalcoatl was attacked by the red god of war. 
the adversary personified either older cults which opposed the establishment of the benevolent mysteries or later cults responsible for the destruction of these institutions. In either case, an inferior state of spiritual enlightenment was implied. The mysteries were institutions of liberation and were naturally opposed by groups seeking to keep their people in bondage through ignorance. The struggle was therefore between religion as temporal authority and the mystery faith, the internal, quote, road of light, unquote. The ruins of the past explain why it was the common belief that the men of good spirit, the initiates, were sacrificed to the material ambitions of temporal rulers. Now, folks, you can apply this same logic to the mystery religion of today. Where they refer to the adversary, they are talking about the same religious institutions, governments, and groups of people that Mr. Hall refers to in discussing the ancient mystery religions of the Aztecs and the Mayans. Only in their modern writings, they will never disclose that. All the aboriginal tribes of North America practiced mystical and magical rites and vestiges of an esoteric tradition served by a priestly class distinguished for sagacity and personal integrity are still to be found among surviving groups. Scattered over a vast area and divided further by lack of a common language, these nomadic bands were approaching the horizon of national existence when the European colonists conquered their lands, decimated their tribes, and destroyed their cultural patterns. So diversified were the traditions of these peoples that it is difficult to summarize their beliefs and doctrines, especially after their legends, histories, and religious institutions were corrupted by outside influences. The European colonists were of no mind to search for the mystical secrets of the Indian life way. These settlers brought their own religious beliefs, which they were resolved to force upon the natives. There were no ethnologists or anthropologists among the Puritans, and many important landmarks of Indian philosophy were destroyed before they had been honestly investigated or appraised. Most of the tribal lore was in the keeping of priests and elders, and if these were killed or died without finding suitable successors, the traditions ended. Even today, older Indians find it difficult to select younger men to perpetuate the sacred institutions. Thus, it is unwise to assume that from available fragments a complete picture of Indian mysticism can ever be reconstructed. The Indian has always been an individualist, and neither circumstance nor inclination induced him to form extensive intertribal organizations. His way of life and the vast silences of his homeland caused him to turn within himself for courage, wisdom, and faith. He could not visit distant shrines of learning or sit at the feet of famous teachers. There were no books to ponder and no ancient sages to guide his religious convictions. Few strangers visited his camp with news or opinions from far places. He was part of a small family in the tribal life with its simple lore was his only source of cultural tradition. A thoughtful observer of nature about him, the Indian lived constantly in the presence of mysteries with no reference frame other than his own imagination. Though stoical in appearance, he was highly emotional as indicated by his songs, dances, and festivals. His sensory perceptions were acute, and his legends indicate strong, dramatic instincts. Among advanced tribes, according to Dr. France Boas, an elaborate series of esoteric doctrines and practices exists which are known to only a small portion of the tribe, while the mass of the people are familiar only with part of the ritual and with its exoteric features. For this reason, we often find the religious beliefs and practices of the mass of a tribe rather heterogeneous as compared with the beliefs held by the priests. Among many of the tribes in which priests are found, we find distinct esoteric societies, and it is not by any means rare that the doctrines of one society are not in accord with those of another. Esoteric forms of religion in charge of priests are found among the tribes of the arid region of the southwest, the tribes of the southern Mississippi basin, and, to a less extent, among the more northerly tribes of the plains. 
It would seem that, on the whole, the importance of the esoteric teachings decreases among the more northerly and northeasterly tribes of the continent. The medicine priests were trained by their predecessors or were called to their life work by some miraculous incident. The little Indian boy, who early in life showed a tendency to dreams and visions, was encouraged to select this career. In a highly organized tribal system, he was initiated into the religious institutions of his nation, receiving the lore of the old priests and fragments of tribal history. If he belonged to some small, wandering band, his entire spiritual education had come from within and was induced by fasting and vigil. The vigil was the most widely practiced religious discipline of the Amerinds. In all matters of emergency or great decision, the Indians sought solitude. He went alone to some high place, built a small campfire, planted around him a circle of prayer plumes, smoked the ceremonial pipe, and waited through the long hours of the night for the voices. The voices instructed him in the herbs of healing, taught him the songs and dances, and brought him news of what was transpiring in distant places. There are many stories about medicine priests learning to leave their bodies at will and journeying into the shadowland to guide the dying to the home of ghosts. Many of these grand old mystics were wise in the ways of the spirit and should be regarded as duly initiated members of esoteric orders. The miraculous powers of the medicine priests extended over a wide variety of phenomena. They healed the sick, protected their tribes. They directed the migrations of their peoples and sought by extrasensory means the location of food, water, and other necessities. They predicted the future. They induced rain and storms, projected themselves to distant places and read the hearts and minds of their fellow men. It was in their power to induce visions and trances and to receive the impressions of the star spirits they also gained considerable proficiency in the mesmeric and hypnotic arts. One Charles F. Loomis, who spent many years among the Southwest Indians of the United States, described the miracles performed by the medicine priests. Although naturally skeptical, his experiences among the Navajo and Pueblo Indians impressed him deeply. Mr. Loomis mentioned how Indians seated in their medicine lodge created miniature thunderstorms within the room, accompanied by flashes of forked lightning, while the outside sky was entirely clear. He says, quote, How the effects are produced I am utterly unable to explain, but they are startlingly real. Unquote. He was also impressed by the ability of the priests to change themselves into animals in the presence of spectators. Some priests could create an artificial sun inside the lodge. This miniature luminary rose in the eastern side of the room, crossed overhead, and set in the west during the performance of the sacred chants. Now, Amerindian priests grow the sacred corn in exactly the same way that the East Indian mendicant grows his mango tree. The magician plants the seed, which grows immediately, and about three hours later the stalk is laden with fully developed ears of corn. Other writers have reported that in some of the medicine lodges the Indians are able to levitate large stones and to cause their own bodies to float in the air. Unprejudiced observers have been forced to conclude that among most tribes of Amerinds, magical rituals are performed involving the use of natural forces beyond the normal experience of human beings. The Amerindic concept of cosmogony paralleled in a general way that of the Chaldeans and other peoples who dwelt in the valley of the Euphrates. The world consisted of three regions, with human beings inhabiting the surface of the central zone. Above this middle land was an airy expanse extending to the abode of the Sky Father, Below the surface were subterranean levels extending downward to the place of the Earth Mother, and this cavernous region was like the dark and shadowy underworld of the pre-Homeric Greeks. 
In the southwest legends, human beings originated beneath the earth in a kind of paradisical land. There also were mountains, valleys, and of course beautiful plains and a sun and moon that lighted the region. In the beginning, everyone was happy. But later an evil deed brought upon them the wrath of the gods. In most accounts, this lovely shadow land was destroyed by a flood. In some miraculous manner, a few righteous persons were preserved and took refuge on a tall plant, which, growing rapidly, finally broke through the surface of the Middle Land, bringing the survivors to safety. The secrets of healing, prophecy, and magic came to the Indian from an order of beings called Manitos. This Algonquin word is now applied to the concept of powerful governing spirits. The Manitos were not actually gods, but superhuman man-like creatures possessing extraordinary attributes and frequently considered as giants. The size factor, however, is figurative rather than literal. The Manitos were a divine, invisible tribe, masters of magic, to whom human beings could turn for help and guidance whenever necessity arose. The effort to explain the term Manito as only signifying a Quote, wonderful power, unquote, and synonymous with the Iroquois Orinda is not sufficient to meet the requirements of the Indian religious philosophy. Orinda conveys more precisely a power or energy universally present in animate and inanimate creatures and manifesting through the vital processes which cause things to exist, to function, and to affect other existing and functioning things. It might be safer folks, to assume that the Manitos represented the intelligence controlling and directing the, quote, wonderful power, unquote. The Indian, therefore, was confronted with the same basic questions which disturbs even the most advanced physicists, namely, is there a supreme intelligence governing universal procedure? The religious concepts of the Indians, writes Dr. Boas, may be described in two groups, those that concern the individual and those that concern the social group, such as tribe and clan. The fundamental concept bearing on the religious life of the individual is the belief in the existence of magic power, which may influence the life of man and which in turn may be influenced by human activity. In this sense, Magic power must be understood as the wonderful qualities which are believed to exist in objects, animals, men, spirits, or deities, and which are superior to the natural qualities of man. Most religions and metaphysical philosophies include hierarchies of divine creatures or tutelary spirits as mediators between the supreme being and mortals. The Manitos acted as wise distributors of the Orinda. The Indian fashioned these demigods in his own likeness, but bestowed upon them superior powers. The Manitos were aware of the most secret human thoughts and the most pressing human needs, and were capable of responding immediately to the rituals of the priests and elders. When the medicine man journeyed to the spirit land, he might be invited to attend a council of Manitos. When he came to the great lodge in the sky, it resembled an earthly council place, except that it was larger, of course more elegant, and usually filled with a strange light. The Manitos were venerable sachems, usually handsome old men, their faces full of kindness. There was a council fire, smoking of the calumet, and the usual speeches and discussions. The lodge was a kind of super-physical senate where all matters of grave import were decided. When the session was concluded, the priest returned to his people along the sky road and reported the decisions of the great lodge. Between the Manitos and mankind were the souls of the illustrious dead. These were the olds and the trues, the sages of long ago, the great chieftains, warriors and statesmen. They had led their people in life, so they continued to guard them from the other land, speaking through the medicine men. It seemed natural 
to the Amorans that the heroes who had gone before should continue to serve the tribes they had guided in the long ago. Totemism was a kind of heraldry among the Indians. The totem was the clan symbol, but even more than that, it was a channel for the distribution of Orinda through the social and political structure of the clan. The totemic animal, or bird, was a spirit guardian, helpful because the creature possessed attributes superior in some particular to those of man. The attribute might be swiftness, strength, cunningness, or resourcefulness, and these qualities the totem creature shared with those under its guardianship. Each Indian also had his own totem, and while it took a familiar form, it was identical in principle with the guardian daemon described in works on the Egyptian and Chaldean mysteries. It was considered a good omen to see one's totem while practicing vigil or in dreams or trances. It proved the proximity of a protecting power. The Abbey Favonet, a missionary to the Algonquins, identifies the totem from Ote, the Ototemen of the Chippewas, with the Manitou concept in these words. It is to be presumed that in uniting into a tribe, each clan preserves its Manitou. The animal, which in the country whence the clan came, was the most beautiful or the most friendly to man, or the most feared or the most common. The animal which was ordinarily hunted there, and which was the ordinary subsistence of the clan, etc., and this animal became the symbol of each family, and that each family transmitted it to its posterity to be the perpetual symbol of each tribe or clan. Modern ethnologists have emphasized that the popular usage of the term totem is incorrect. The symbol is not strictly religious, but involves a social and family concept with emphasis upon the importance of kinship. You remember we talked about the history of the religion and the mystery school of the ancient Aztecs, the Mayas, and the other American Indians of the old Americas before Europeans set foot upon these shores. In fact, if you've been listening closely to the previous episodes of America's Assignment with Destiny, you may have already understood that the Indians were practicing almost exactly the same mystery religion that was present in the Middle East and in Egypt long, long before the birth of Christ. Many tribes, especially the Plains Indians, believed that thunder and lightning were caused by enormous birds. The rumbling sounds in the sky accompanying storms were due to the flapping of their wings, and the flashes of light were caused by the opening and closing of their eyes. In some groups, only one thunderbird was recognized. In other tribes, there were several of various colors or a family of them. The appearance of the bird or birds is not definitely given. It might be similar to a large hawk, an eagle, or even a grouse. The thunderbird could use its wings as a bow to shoot arrows, and small meteors were believed to be the heads of these arrows. On the plains, thunderstorms were said to result from a contest between a thunderbird and a huge rattlesnake or dragon-like monster. Persons struck by lightning, if they recovered, were accepted as sages or holy men, having received a very strong medicine from this experience. In some areas, the thunderbird was closely associated with the religious mysteries or societies. Those who saw this creature in their vigils usually considered themselves as intended for a religious life. The myths and legends of the Thunderbird are similar to the European and Asiatic accounts of the fabled phoenix, which you're hearing an awful lot about even today. The phoenix nested in flames and symbolized initiation and adeptship, and today it symbolizes the New World Order rising from the ashes of the old. Death and rebirth, resurrection, reincarnation, all of these are the symbols, are symbolized by the phoenix. Early drawings of the great seal of the United States indicate that the bird represented thereon was a phoenix rather than the eagle that you see today. 
Like the Mexican coat of arms, which shows an eagle with a serpent in its claws, the American device is strongly reminiscent of a thunderbird. These creatures were also said to inhabit a sky world above the clouds and served as messengers between mortals and the heavenly beings. Farther south, the thunderbird symbol merged with the quetzal and the serpent feathered with quetzal plumes. The quetzal was identical in meaning with the phoenix of Asia, North Africa, and the Near East. The feathered serpent symbolism can be traced back to the hooded nagas, or serpent gods of India, and to the winged serpents which occur in the writings and sculpturings of the ancient Egyptians. The serpent was the messenger and servant of the earth mother because it dwelt below ground. For this reason, rattlesnakes were released during the snake dances in order that they might carry the petitions of the tribe to the mother who dwelt below. Birds were also carriers of tidings, and as they flew upward, they bore with them prayers to the great father who lived in the sky lodge. The thunderbird was the most powerful and was the lord of flying things. The thunderbird and the feathered snake were symbolical of the mysteries of the upper and lower regions. Priestly orders served this twofold cult, the secrets of which were revealed only by an internal mystical experience. Now remember the ancient Egyptian religion? They had the mysteries of the upper and lower regions, and the priestly orders served this twofold cult also, the androgynous god. Britain, describing various devices used by the Amer Indian tribes to conserve their religious secrets, says, All these stratagems were intended to shroud with impenetrable secrecy the mysteries of the Brotherhood. With the same motive, the priests formed societies of different grades of illumination, only to be entered by those willing to undergo trying ordeals whose secrets were not to be revealed under the severest penalties. Now, anyone who's listened to our series on Mystery Babylon, the Mystery Schools, will recognize the exact same religious philosophy that permeated first the old Mediterranean world and northern Africa, and then through the episodes of the Crusades and the Templars was brought into Europe and persists to this day all over the world. The Algonquins had three such grades. Remember the three degrees of initiation? Three degrees in six acts, or 18, six, six, six. The three grades of the Algonquins were the Wabino, the Meda, and the Josakid, the last, of course, being the highest. To this, no white man was ever admitted. All tribes appear to have been controlled by these secret societies, just as our modern society is controlled by the mysteries today. Among the Amerindians, secret societies existed for the perpetuation and enlargement of the choicest knowledge of the tribe. Remember, at the heart and soul of the mysteries, is illumination, the light, Lucifer. Lucifer, of course, is represented by the sun, which is the wisdom of the world. <laughs> it represents the intellect. Remember the Garden of Eden, the story? That Lucifer, through his agent, Satan enticed Eve, and thus man, to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and told them that they would not surely die? and that they would be as gods? Well, this is the promise. And with that gift of intellect that man received from Satan, indirectly from Lucifer, man himself will become God. This is the heart and soul of the mystery schools. There were war associations, healing cults, and fraternities, concerned with the religious mysteries, the keeping of records, and the dramatization of myths. There were ethical societies, orders of mirth makers, fire walkers, and hunters presided over by elders who had distinguishing regalia. Women frequently became leaders of these groups. Among the Pueblo Indians, there were often a dozen or more societies in one village. 
While their objectives were not always parallel, there was no friction among the memberships, and they united in all common responsibilities. The Indian was always a tolerant man on the subject of spiritual convictions. He never inquired as to the faith of his guest, but expected that every true believer would conduct himself in an honorable way. He respected the rights of strangers, and if he did not share in them or did not understand their meanings, he kept a respectful silence. The reference to the dramatization of myths suggests that a number of Indian tribes were practicing the same methods of presenting religious mysteries that were employed by the Greeks and the Egyptians. Most Indian festivals emphasized songs and dances, but the songs were used principally to establish rhythms, and the words were of slight importance. Chants were a vital element in most healing ceremonies. Either the Western Hemisphere received a vital religious stimulus from early voyagers and travelers from distant parts, or else the Indian himself, by mystical experiences, shared a common inspiration with the priestly castes of other nations. The psychologist would probably assume that the esoteric tradition originated in the spiritual needs of the human being, regardless of his race or place of habitation. But that does not fit any test of common sense. In fact, it's ludicrous. The search for reality gradually brought into being specialized groups of intensive truth seekers, and these groups produced their own leaders, and such wise men and women were acknowledged as divinely inspired, received spontaneous admiration and devotion, were obeyed for their superior endowments, and gradually became a priestly caste. As civilization enlarged the temporal state of the tribe, the religious societies grew to become powerful institutions, as in Central America. While the tribes remained nomadic, the medicine men were less resplendent and impressive, but their functions were no less insignificant. These holy persons seldom took part in war, and frequently were distinguished by a costume combining elements of male and female attire. Remember, the god is an androgynous god, bipolar, male, female, positive, negative, bad, good, divine, and evil, all within the same. And this is the truth, this is the reality in all of the mysteries. This practice of wearing male and female attire has been common throughout the religious world and has influenced the dress of pagan priests and Christian clergy alike. For example, the Catholic priest, the Catholic bishop, the androgynous human being in whom there is a spiritual union of male and female attributes has been widely accepted as personifying a superior type capable of a greater understanding of the Father wisdom and mother love potencies of divinity. Such symbolism, ladies and gentlemen, existed in all of the great esoteric orders of the past. While ethnologists may be reluctant to admit that the Indians had any formal concept of an esoteric religion, examination into the secret beliefs of the priests of the various tribes shows that they were verging toward the adept tradition, even if it had not matured among them. The Midawiwin, our great medicine society of the Ojibwes, initiated both men and women into the secrets of the art of healing and the control of the vital current coursing through the nerve centers of the human body. The society of the Medes, or shamans, had birch bark rolls which depicted the arrangements of the lodges and included many strange pictographs. Of these, W.J. Hoffman writes, quote, to persons acquainted with secret societies, a good comparison for the Midowiwin charts would be what is called a trestle board of the Masonic order, which is printed and published and publicly exposed without exhibiting any secrets of the order. Yet, it is not only significant, but useful to the esoteric in assistance to their memory as to the details of the ceremony." Unquote. The secrets of the Midowiwin were originally communicated to mankind by an initiate priest, Manabozo, or Great Rabbit, who was a servant of the Good Spirit. The cross was an important symbol in the Midowiwin rites, 
and it is interesting that the Medes steadfastly refused to give up their religion and be converted to Christianity. The controversy as to the possible Masonic significance of the Midwiwin rites may be noted, but has slight bearing upon the essential facts. Although the birch bark rolls have bestowed prominence upon the activities of this society, other tribes practiced equally significant rituals and ceremonies. Candidates advanced through four degrees, traveling toward the east. And where have you heard that before, steady listeners? And the lodge rooms were enclosures open to the sky and connecting with each other through doors and passageways so that they could look upon the celestial sphere. The neophyte was tested and subjected to trials and hazards, and also was presented with a sequence of visual arrangements of symbols and other esoteric paraphernalia. The purpose of the Great Medicine Society was to enlighten the human mind and soul and to bind the initiates to the service of their people. It included a method for stimulating extrasensory perceptions and a personal investigation into the secrets of nature. In 1919, Arthur C. Parker was invited into a secret lodge of the Senecas to witness their ceremonies. Here he heard the legend of Red Hand, a culture hero, who could hold conversation with the great mystery. From the great mystery, he learned to love all the creatures of the earth, and he spoke the language of the birds and animals. Red Hand was slain by a poisoned arrow because he would not reveal to his assassin the secret of his spiritual power. The animals, discovering by the power of scent that their brother friend had been killed, gathered in council about his body to find a means of bringing him back to life. Each of the creatures gave part of himself to restore Red Hand to the living. At last the bear came forward, and grasping the hand of the martyred hero, raised him by the strong grip of his paw. Those acquainted with the ritual of the third degree of the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry will realize that this story must have originated among the rituals of the esoteric schools because it is the exact same ceremony of the raising of the Master Mason at the end of the initiation of the third degree by the grip of the lion's paw. Mr. Parker himself, a 32nd degree Freemason, sums up the account of his experience in the rites of the Senecas thusly, quote, Little has been told. The door has only been held ajar the slightest space, and no, no secrets have been revealed. There were feather wands and deer skins, but no purple robes or crowns. Yet who shall say that the Senecas have not the thread of the legend of Osiris, or that they have not an inherent Freemasonry? Unquote. And indeed, who can say? In the area centering in what is now New York State, and extending north and south a considerable distance, the five later six nations comprising the Iroquois League, attained a high state of social and political integrity. The two great leaders of these Amerinds were Deganoida and Hiawatha. It is impossible to study the life of Deganoida, whose coming was announced by a mysterious visitor from the heaven world, without realizing that he fulfilled all the requirements of the adept tradition. Deganawida was born of an immaculate conception. Let me say that again for you folks. Deganawida was born of an immaculate conception, possessed the power to work miracles, prayed and fasted, practiced the vigils, was confirmed in his mission by the Great Father, and passed through numerous trials and persecutions. Hiawatha became his first and most distinguished disciple, and these two, working together, sought to establish everlasting peace among their peoples. The founder of the Inca dynasty of Peru was the initiate statesman Manco Capac, who flourished in the 11th century A.D. He reformed the social and religious life of the tribes of the Aymara, Quichua race, in the capital city of Cusco, which he built. 
Mako Kapak established the religion of the sun. He was a statesman of ability and claimed to be a direct descendant of the sun god. The empire of the Incas, which he founded, is remembered especially for its experiments in socialized living. Peru has the distinction of having cradled the first successful utopia. And folks, I would argue with that. If it was so successful, where is it today? Manly P. Hall probably would disagree with that, saying that for its time, it was a successful utopia. Utopia means perfect, folks. It means the best. It means the fulfillment of all the ideals and could never pass away if it was, in fact, a successful utopia. And that's the problem with these priests of the mystery religion and their dream of a world utopia made up of imperfect men ruled by imperfect men who have other agendas, who have selfishness, who covet who steal and lie. We all struggle with those things every day. And anyone who stands before me and tells me that they do not struggle with these imperfections of man and with the temptations of the material world and of the flesh, then I see before me a liar. Manco Kapak emerges as one of the world's outstanding social reformers with a vision thousands of years ahead of his time. He is said to have brought with him to Peru a divine bird in a sacred wicker hamper. This golden falcon is a form of the phoenix and testifies to the presence of the adept doctrine. Manco Capac combines in his own person the offices of priest and king, like the Melchizedeks of Christian mysticism. Christian mysticism? Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen. You didn't know this, but Christianity started out as a secret society, and later, later was even named the Friendly Open Secret Society. It wasn't open at all, and it had degrees of initiation which exist in the priesthood even today. Although some historians may be a trifle impulsive when they suggest that Manco Capac was a Buddhist priest, there can be no doubt that the Peruvian culture was heavily influenced by symbols, rituals, and philosophical elements usually associated with the trans area of Central Asia. Now, if Manco Capac was not a Buddhist priest from the Far East, how did he bring these teachings to the Indian people, who had never seen or heard of him before and knew not from whence he came? In Daganawida, with his great league, Quetzalcoatl, Kulkulkan, and his splendid socialized empires in Mexico and Central America, and Manco Capac, and the communal system which he set up in Peru, we have three clear and definite accounts of initiate leaders establishing schools of esoteric doctrines in the Western Hemisphere. From a consideration of their attainments and the systems which they inaugurated, we can come to but one conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. The mystery schools of antiquity were represented in the Americas by institutions identical in principle and in purpose with those of Asia and the Mediterranean countries. How could this be? How indeed? Is it true that at one time, according to the theory of plate tectonics, that all of the continents were together in one, and that there was free interchange and activity conducted between all of the peoples of the earth? Were they indeed at one time ruled by one great ruler in one great city? And was there at one time one great continent in the whole world known as Atlantis? And was the scattering of the peoples and the mixing of the languages and the tangling of the tongues described in the Bible was this merely the breakup of that one continent as the plate tectonics began to move away from each other? As the earth's crust shrank and molten magma compressed below began to push up and separate, separate the pieces of land from each other? Was this the scattering of the peoples? 
Was this the destruction of the Tower of Babel? Was this was this the real truth of what happened in history? It doesn't say that here. This is what has come to mind in my own research and may account for many of the legends of all the peoples of the earth. We have much more study to do, much more putting together of the pieces of the puzzle. But it appears to us that at one time, at one time, all of the peoples of the world had a common source of religion and knowledge, and that somehow these people were scattered over the earth and lost their contact with each other and lost their contact with the source of their religion and their knowledge. And even though some, some of the portions of their society and some of their religions may differ slightly, at the heart and core of all of them, they are the same. And that is what is important, that you understand that somehow the great mystery religions and the great societies that existed in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia and Greece and eventually in Europe were nothing new to the peoples who lived in South America and North America and on the Asian continent. And the mysteries were even known to the aboriginals on the continent of Australia, in the islands of New Guinea, in the rainforests of the Amazon jungle. So you see, folks, what we are talking about here is not the story, not the story of one sacrificed king. <laughs>